G'day viewers, all three of you, or is it four now? Yeah, your friendly neighbourhood uh, Tavo here. In my earlier video at the Adelaide Chrysler Festival, I said I was going to make a few more videos uh, on the individual models of Valiants. And I thought, well, before we do that, we'll go back to a, a history of Chrysler Australia and where it all began. And to go back to the beginnings, we're going all the way back to 1885, uh, when Tobias, or better known as T.J. Richards, um, he was a blacksmith and a wheelwright, and he decided to start making horse storm buggies, as was the thing in the day. Um, he built that business up uh, along there from a little place in, called Mitcham, to about uh, five miles south east at the Adelaide city centre and he soon outgrew that and bought a place uh, in the city of Adelaide in Hindmarsh Square, much bigger, more suitable premises. And uh, after the turn of the century, the motor car became the big thing. So naturally he expanded to uh, making motor car bodies for various different brands and a lot of brands in fact. Uh, around the same time, uh, another South Australian, uh, James Alexander Holden, rather, uh, and his partner Henry Frost, who were settlers, they were doing the same thing. Uh, once World War I had hit, and uh, that was over, Australia had a bit of a, an issue with imports and uh, the lack of shipping, so the Australian government placed import restrictions on motor cars. And the requirement of that was that for every complete motor car imported, uh, the company had to import two chassis. A side effect of that was boosting the local industry, of course, and building bodies. Uh, at the same time, the Ford Motor Company built their own cars, uh, complete knockdown kits of the Model T in Geelong, Victoria. So Ford were out of the picture there. And um, the two South Australians continued building bodies for a lot of companies. Uh, Richards soon outgrew that Highmark Square premises and in 1920 purchased a seven and a half acre lot at Keswick which is uh, just west of the city and building at the time a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility. Still growing strong he then acquired another factory in nearby Mile End. Uh, it's a couple of miles away if that. Uh, in 1928 when the majority of the assembly work was done at Mile End and all the component manufacturers still retained at Keswick. Uh, Keswick still manufactured a few vehicles but uh, the Mile End premises was more for the CKD kits, uh, entire cars. <coughs> About that time, a uh, deal was struck with Chrysler Corporation for the sole rights to build the Chrysler vehicles in Australia and uh, Holden struck a similar deal with General Motors. So there you have your General Motors Holdens after uh, General Motors bought out Holdens in 1931. Uh, later in the 1930s, a conglomerate of dealers created Chrysler Dodge Distributors Limited. That was a strong cooperative. And in 1936, Chrysler Dodge Distributors bought shares into TJ Richards. And in 1937, the following year, they bought the controlling stake in Richards. Uh, World War II came soon after that and the company was renamed Richards Industries and like most factories in the country, they shifted to manufacturing munitions and aircraft parts for the war effort. Uh, after World War II, the remaining shares of Richards were sold to Chrysler Dodge Distributors and the company renamed to Chrysler Dodge DeSoto Distributors. Makes sense. Uh, in 1951, Chrysler Corporation then bought out 85% of Chrysler Dodge DeSoto distributors, then renaming the company yet again, this time to Chrysler Australia Limited. That's the name it kept until 1980, when the Japanese giant at the time, Mitsubishi Motors, bought, bought out the entire operations. But getting back into the time frame, during the first half of the 1950s, uh, local production of the American Dodge, Plymouth and DeSoto vehicles carried on as it had prior to Chrysler's acquisition. 
With most panels being pressed at Keswick, all trim produced locally, and assembly of the vehicle split between Keswick and Mile End. And the latter, as I said before, catering more to assembling complete knockdown kits of the lower volume larger cars. And one thing to add context in that era, the population of Australia in the late 50s was only around 11 million people compared to what the states had. New car sales would be around three to 400,000 in a good year. Now, I spread that over all the brands, there's not a lot of sales to cover the engineering and tooling costs to build a car. And those costs have to be absorbed in the price of each one sold. So also noteworthy then is in 1959, General Motors Holden held 50% of the entire market share of new vehicles. That doesn't leave a lot of cars left for everybody else to build. So on those sales, Holdens could afford to tool up for their new models. And Chrysler on the other hand, even if they did borrow all of the engineering from the states where that cost is easily covered, they still had to finance the duplication of tooling. Um, with new models being released in 55 in the US, the current lineup of the Dodge Kingsway, Plymouth Cranbrook and the DeSoto Diplomat triplets being very dated already, uh, Chrysler's plan was to give the cars a fresh appearance at minimal cost, otherwise they just couldn't afford to carry on. So this here was the result. A very clever grafting, the 1955 Plymouth front, the 56 rear, to the existing vehicle main body section, which was from the 53 to 55 um, Plymouth Dodge DeSoto. Uh, they changed the back window to wrap around a little bit into the huge pillars to give it a more modern look then. Now initially that was to be called the AD1 Dodge, the AP1 Plymouth, and the AS1 DeSoto. A decision later was made to only produce the final Plymouth version to keep costs down even further. And they renamed it the Chrysler Royal. Re retained the AP1 designation, but that now stood for Australian Production One. And created the first unique to Australia Chrysler vehicle. Released in 57, it underwent two facelifts, the AP2 and the AP3 models, all borrowing upgrades from similar year American models, along with running a few changes mechanically as they went. And they sold up until 1963 alongside the earlier Valiants. And as history will tell, the Chrysler Royal was still dated, it was too big, was too heavy and too expensive to compete with the Holden and now the Falcon. So along comes the Valiant, the lighter, more modern and more basic car. That became Chrysler Australia's saviour. So guys, um, I hope you uh, got something out of this video. If you did, give it a like. If you want to see the uh, upcoming ones on the Valiant, subscribe to the channel, you'll get the notifications when the videos come out and um, I'll come up as promised. This was just a little one in the middle. So we'll see you in the next one on the Valiance. Bye for now, thanks for watching.